Welcome to the Rising Laterally podcast. You will be exposed to a blend of insights, research, stories, and unique guests so that you become more fascinated about yourself and the world we live in. By connecting industries, technologies, histories, and psychologies, you can find intersections to shift your perspective and find more meaning in your life. Our commitment is to bring you an episode every week. We ask that you please support us by subscribing on Apple, Spotify, YouTube, or any other major podcasting platform you use, and by rating us or leaving us a review on our Instagram and Twitter accounts. From the bottom of our hearts, we want to say thank you for listening, supporting, sharing your favorite episodes, and for helping build this community together. This is Arjun Sachdev, and on behalf of Jay Baloo, we hope you enjoy this Rising Laterally podcast episode. All right, today's guest is Lisa Marciano. Joining us from Philadelphia, Lisa is a psychotherapist and certified Jungian analyst. For those of you who don't know, Jungian analysts practice the psychotherapeutic approach pioneered by the Swiss luminary Carl Jung, who is Sigmund Freud's uh, protege. He's a man I'm sure we'll be talking about a lot in this episode. Uh, Lisa also co-hosts the very brilliant podcast, This Jungian Life, with two of her fellow friends and analysts. Lisa, uh, we're really grateful to have you on the show. I think maybe an interesting place to start might be with your work. You know, the training to become a Jungian analyst is no joke. I was reading it could take up to eight years uh, to, to get that certification. So maybe you can tell our audience a little bit about what you do and how the Jungian approach differs from something more conventional like the cognitive behavioral approach and maybe why that difference uh, drove you towards that work. Okay, well, that is a very big question, but let me uh, start by saying that in general, in this in the psychotherapeutic world, they're kind of l- largely two big groups. One would be depth psychologies and and other psychologies. So depth psychologies would be Jungian, Freudian, psychoanalytic, object relations, and the thing that all of those groups have in common is that they acknowledge that there is an unconscious and that the unconscious plays a significant role in how we navigate our lives. Cognitive behavioral doesn't necessarily deal with the unconscious. Even, I think there are some therapists who practice cognitive behavioral uh, uh, psychology that, that say, well, I'm not even really sure there is an unconscious or if there is, maybe it's not that important. So I don't wanna speak for them, maybe yeah. I put that wrong, but that's my impression. So Jungian analysis is one of the depth schools the idea of the unconscious was very important to Jung. And Jungian psychology varies a little bit, has a lot in common with Freudian and object relations and relational psychoanalysis and these other schools. You know, there, there's plenty of points where they touch. I think uh, there are many things that set Jung apart. It's a little hard to get it all into a sentence or two. Mm -hmm. But if I were going to try, I would say that Jung was very interested in meaning. He felt that a lot of people that came to him for analysis were suffering because they had a lack of meaning in their lives. And he thought that this was something critical that we all need. So, you know, you might say that Jung had a kind of spiritual bent to his psychology and uh, that, that he addresses those kinds of needs. So I'll leave it there for now, but I'm sure we'll be talking more about that. Yeah, absolutely. And that is, I think, one of the things that really drove me to Jung um, was just the, the meaning that's bundled in a lot of his teaching. And it's, it's hard for me to put my finger on because you know he does reference God a lot. He obviously references Christian tradition a lot, but at no point is there, you know, a promise of the afterlife or some kind of, um, you know, par- paradisal eternity. You know, it still all feels very um, rational in a sense, even though he's at the same time embracing the irrational mystery of life itself. So it's, uh, you know, it's something that I think is so rich because there is that kind of paradox baked into it. Yeah, and you're picking up on something that's really important about Jung's biography, actually, is that he was the son of a pastor. His father was a pastor, and he had lots and lots of clergy people in, on both sides of the family, but his father um, didn't believe. So his father had this kind of uh, hollow experience of um, 
doing this work as a pastor and, and ultimately not believing in God. And mm. Jung found this out about his father when he was an adolescent and it kind of shook him to his core. And in some way, I think it really shaped his interest and what he was trying to, uh, the questions he was trying to answer throughout his life with his psychology and his philosophy. And on his mother's side, she was, she came from a family also of clergy people, but she uh, kind of also um, had these experiences that we might call kind of parapsychological experiences. So she had this kind of mediumistic aspect to her and so did members of her family. Um, and so, you know, and then here comes Jung into that mix and holding both of these. And then he says, he goes off to college to study medicine. He says, I'm going to be a scientist. Mm. So he's kind of holding these three strands of kind of spiritualism almost and traditional religion and then science. And he's trying to wrestle with all of those. And you can see him doing that throughout his work. And he does take on religion, he felt that um, there, there was a, we were hardwired to relate to the world um, in a way that he would describe as religious, but he wasn't talking about kind of dogmatic uh, churches with their credos. He was really talking about the need to relate to something larger than self. He said at one point, the decisive question for a man is, is he related to something large or not? Mm. Uh, it's a bad paraphrase of something that's in his autobiography but that that's the question do you feel related to something larger or not and that is in essence a question about a kind of religious attitude not that you have to belong to a church to feel that way some people do um, but you know we can all feel related to something larger than self even without belonging to a conventional uh, religion Agreed. So in a way, I mean, it sounds like there's also this like sameness of experience. If you do believe or think about the idea that, you know, we all need to be a part of larger, something larger than ourselves. And that actually is a feeling that we may all be striving for. We're not necessarily being able to label it as, as that way. Yeah, I think that's a great point. Um, Jung actually called it the religious function of the psyche. And I think what you're picking up on, Arjun, is we might feel that in church, say, if we are a believer and we go to church, we might find that same sense becoming part of a mass political movement. Mm. Um, we might find that uh, mm. in being gripped by um, a belief in UFOs, you know, we're kind of wired to relate to the world this way. And if we don't find it in a traditional conventional religion, we're probably gonna stumble into it in another way, which might work great for us, but sometimes those other ways can be problematic. Um, you know, the, uh, oh my God, I can't remember his name right now, but the novelist who wrote Infinite Jest. Oh, David Foster Wallace. Thank you. He said, nice. there's no such thing as not worshiping. We yeah. all worship something. And I think that's exactly, I think Jung was saying exactly the same thing. Is that we all worship something. And if you ask yourself, what is it I worship? You know, there's something you worship. And, and it's probably a good idea to be aware of what you worship. Because that can really impact how we move through the world. For sure. And with your, your patients or um, analysands, is that the right uh, either clients, either patients, okay, yeah, clients yeah do you find that they come in for treatment in the in the grip of something that they're worshiping without perhaps realizing that they're worshiping it well that's a good question um sometimes yes and and sometimes people come in in crisis because they're not they're not in touch with something that gives their life a sense of greater meaning and purpose um, and so, yeah, they might be worshiping maybe the wrong thing, you know, like you're worshiping money or you're worshiping status or you're wor worshiping, you know, a substance mm -hmm. or you're, you're worshiping what your parents told you you should worship and you haven't found your own unique way of relating to the infinite. Right. 
So, you know, earlier in your comments, you mentioned Jung and his interest in finding meaning or having a meaning. When I think about that comment in the context of what folks might be experiencing during this lockdown, I want to ask you your thoughts or what you ask your patients or what they might be saying from their perspective. Like when, if somebody loses their lack of agency right now, how do they build up the courage to keep going? Or, you know, what can they think about in their psyche to overcome that hurdle? Yeah, what a, what a great question. I mean, for me, this, this goes to something that Jung never talked about directly. It wasn't a psychological concept that existed until I forget if it was just at the end of Jung's life or shortly after. Jung died in 1960, I think it was 1961. Um, it was either 1961 or 1963, but I think it was 61. There's this um, concept called an internal versus external locus of control. Mm. And, um, and as you might guess, having an internal locus of control gives you a sense of agency that you have the ability to influence what happens in your world. An external locus of control is a sense that it doesn't matter what I do. You know, no matter what I do, things are just going to happen to me. Um, psychologists have studied this and found that people with an internal locus of control are more likely to be resilient in the face of trauma, for example. Um, it, an internal locus of control generally leads to better outcomes in life. Generally, I'm going to talk about some exceptions. Mm -hmm. But you know, an internal locus of control, when you when you think about it, it starts to look awfully like what the Stoics encouraged, that kind of mm -hmm. attitude of really taking radical responsibility for your life. And Jung was kind of down that same path. He he says somewhere, you know, the question is. He says something like, I'm going to paraphrase it. He says something like, um, you know, it's easy to blame your parents for what happened to you. But a, a really mature person will say, who am I such that these things have happened to me? Mm -hmm. So, you know, you have to be careful there because it sounds like you're sort of victim blaming. But right. that is a really profound question. No matter what has happened to you, to say, who am I such that these things have happened to me? And when we get to ask that question, it's a very psychological question. Then we're really taking ownership of ourselves and responsibility of ourselves in a really radical way. And we're in that, that realm of a kind of internal locus of control. So to answer your question, and then I'll double back and just talk a little bit more about this. I think that if we find ourselves um, disempowered or, or, or kind of stripped of our usual agency because of COVID or any other circumstances, you know, it certainly is true that there are life circumstances that take away our agency. I'm not, I'm not in favor of any of these kinds of positive philosophies where we're just going to manifest the reality that we want. No, the world doesn't actually work that way. But we can ask ourselves, where do I have agency? Where can I take responsibility for my life? You know, it's, um, I mean, I mean, to, to sound to sound really dreadfully, um, awfully uh, um, boring here. You know, a lot of people I know gained weight during the lockdown, you know, which I think is so understandable. You know, we're stressed out. <laughs> There's nothing up. <laughs> my, my, my teenage daughter said to me partway through lockdown, she goes, I'm so tired of the only exciting thing in my life being food. Oh. <laughs> you know, it's like, oh God, I hear you, you know. Um, the gyms are closed, but you know, you can still go take a walk, right? You can still put on your running shoes and go for a run. You can, you know, get on your bike and go for a bike ride, you know, and it's, so it's like, okay, or you can get a piece of exercise equipment and stick it in a corner of your apartment. You know, there, there are things you can do. And are you doing And Arjun? I see you have actually an exercise bike behind you, don't you? Oh, absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> it's a great time. Doing it right. It's a so, great time to get your mind, body, and soul back recalibrated. Yes. Yes. So you you can you know there 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 are, there are things you can do, and I think that's kind of the point of that that internal locus of control. It's like okay, there might be things I can't do, but what can I do? And if I can keep on riffing on this for a minute, yeah. Um, you know, I want to say that where where having an external locus of control can be adaptive is if the world is really crushing you and you are in that internal locus of control place, you're like, I'm going to 
I'm gonna fight it, I'm gonna come back, I'm gonna see what I can do. You might just be spending yourself uselessly. Sometimes it is better to just say, hey, there's nothing I can do. I'm just going to accept what's happening. That can be adaptive as well. And this is where uh, the serenity prayer that they teach you in AA is, is a great piece of wisdom. It's, you know, grant me the um, courage to change the things I can. That's the internal locus of control. The serenity to accept the things I cannot change. That's the external locus of control and the wisdom to know the difference. And that's the hard part. <laughs> totally. Yeah, absolutely. Making that, uh, being able to draw those li- that bright line between things that you can change and things you can't is something I think that we're all sorting out uh, every day. I, I guess the, my question would be, why do you think it is that some people can face a tremendous amount of adversity and retain a strong sense of that internal locus of control and some people you know can face less adversity or no adversity and still remain without that strong center i mean it's it's just interesting how people can react to trauma and adversity at all different stages of life be it in childhood or their late adolescence or adulthood you know people can respond differently and uh, even people that have faced terrible situations where you would anticipate you know a, a normal person would crumble uh, in the face of that, they still maintain that kind of strength of character. So how do you kind of think about where, why there's such a disparity in the way people handle the challenges of life? Well, this is a huge question. It's a question that's very much of interest to uh, researchers. And there's research done on people that they call super survivors, people who've been through horrendous trauma, horrendous, horrendous, horrendous trauma, and they're doing great. (laughs) Yeah. In fact, you know, I, I remember hearing about um, some study that was done of really high achieving people over the past 200 years, say I'm probably getting the details wrong. But one thing that many of them had in common is that they had lost a parent. And there can be a way that adversity kindles us to uh, greater achievement and greater resilience. There's something called post-traumatic growth disorder. Uh, where you go through something really difficult and afterwards you kind of blossom. And there are some, in, there's some imagery for that. You know, there's uh, the lotus seed mm. is very, very hard and it has to just have the shit beaten out of it before it can blossom, you know? Mm. And maybe sometimes the human psyche is a little bit like that. I, I want to say that I think what we're talking about though is a very, very big mystery. And I don't want to say that trauma doesn't absolutely break people, um, that things happen to us completely outside of our control that are, that's really damaging and hurtful and limits potential. You know, we know that trauma can have a terrible impact on people's ability to consolidate a functioning ego, to, to learn, to relate to other people. It can be really damaging, you know, it, um, when you start getting into attachment theory, you know, if we've had relational attachment as a child, it can make it very difficult to be in a healthy relationship later. There's all kinds of things that adverse experiences uh, do to us that are bad, including affect our health negatively. So I don't, I don't want to simplify this or flatten it. I I do think it's interesting to look at the mystery part of it. Mm. What I think I will say, which, um, You know, well, Jung said this in so many words, but it's not like he spent time really laying this out, but he he does talk about this, is is a little bit uh, the sense of, can we cultivate a resilient attitude in ourselves? Can we cultivate that sense of an internal locus of control? And I think we can. You know, again, I think that that is in some sense at the heart of the Stoics, the Stoic philosophy. So that's a good place to look if you want to know more. But I do worry that some cultural currents now are inviting us into infirmity and um, kind of a lack of resilience. Mm -hmm. That, you know, for example, the stuff about trigger warnings on college campuses, you know, it, it kind of sends a communication that you might be too fragile to read this book. And, Mm -hmm. and I, and I think that that kind of sends the wrong message. I think we ought to be sending the message that, you know, yeah, there might be some sub- upsetting stuff in here, but I bet you can handle it. 
So I, I'm, I sort of track that just culturally. What message are we sending, especially to our young people, about about what we expect their resilience to be? Because I think that people respond to expectations that we have of them. Mm -hmm. And I think just in, I, I forget the name of the book, but I think Jonathan Haidt wrote a the book. The Coddling of the American Mind. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And even, you know, going back to childhood, I mean, the fact that kids have so much less leash now than they did decades ago. I mean, the idea that there's, you know, potentially some boogeyman out there that's going to kidnap you and kill you was kind of like, you know, inculcated in, I think, kids on, on you know, by parents that were just worried about their own safety. But, you know, you had, do look at the numbers and you wonder how much of that came from media and was a hysteria that, you know, maybe did more harm than good. Absolutely. Absolutely. There's also an element of maybe building a resilient attitude or cultivating a resilient culture by showing that curiosity can be a driving force and being more curious about things because there are different levels and aspects to curiosity. And maybe it's the fact that people just need help bringing some of these shadow mm -hmm. elements up into their consciousness to realize that mm -hmm. like mm -hmm. curiosity, like it only killed the cat. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. There's, a, you know, someone once, um, Someone once, uh, I read somewhere, you know, how do you sum up young in, you know, one sentence? And the, I wish I could cite this because this, this is someone else's thought, but I really liked it and I remembered it, so I'm going to share it. And the answer was, everything belongs. Mm -hmm. and, and there is, and I think that comes with, with curiosity, like whatever comes up for us, can we allow it to be there? and be curious about it, not necessarily act on it. So if we find ourselves having a torture fantasy of, you know, someone who- Torturing our boss or something. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> you know, it's like, well, no, I don't want you to go torture your boss. I, that, that is not a good idea, don't do that. But could you, could, you, could you notice that you're having that fantasy and say, huh, that's interesting. I'm, I'm having that fantasy. I wonder what that's about. I wonder what would happen if I allowed myself to just think about that fantasy a little bit more and maybe imagine it all the way through. Like, what would, what would I learn? Where would I go? You know, we, we could sort of explore anything in fantasy. Mm, yeah, that's, a, that's something that I gathered from uh, a book by Robert A. Johnson called Inner Work uh, mm -hmm. that I found pretty impactful. Just the idea of being able, I actually used it as a method to re-engage dreams in waking life. So if I had a dream that was particularly upsetting, you know, I would sit on my couch, light a candle, close my eyes and try to take myself back into that dream and populate my imagination with the kind of characters and events of that dream and try to reconnect with them. And, you know, it is a little bit of a, you kind of feel a little bit goofy the first time you do it. Cause you're like, what am I doing? Am I really just talking to myself here? Is all this sort of being fabricated but if you let yourself drop deep enough into it you know interesting things do kind of start to arise definitely well you've just given a really great description of Jung's technique of active imagination which was one of the important techniques really that he employed and he encouraged uh, his analysands to employ and it was taken very very seriously and like you said it can be it feels a little goofy in the beginning, but it can be incredibly, incredibly rich because you're having a dialogue with other parts of yourself, which that's a kind of central idea of Jung's is that the unconscious is filled with all kinds of things, negative and positive, but definitely new creative possibilities. And that when we're in harmony with ourselves, we are able to have a dialogue with the unconscious. It's not like, oh, the unconscious is so wise and we need to just figure out what the unconscious wants and get rid of the ego and just do whatever the unconscious says, no. But that there's a kind of a healthy dialogue. And so what you're doing when you're lying on your couch and lighting a candle and having that imagination is you are allowing your unconscious to talk to you, which, is, which brings, I think, a lot of greater psychological stability and health. Mm -hmm, for sure. It, Arjun, one thing Arjun and I have talked a lot about too is the idea of the collective unconscious. And I'm still kind of trying to 
disentangle the personal unconscious from the collective unconscious and figure out what the difference is. But maybe you can just tell us a little bit of, more about how you conceptualize the unconscious, whether it's you know unique to us or whether it is some you know latent knowledge that comes from ancestors or our own biology or something that's you know transpersonal. Mm -hmm. Well, I think you've just summed it up really well, actually. Jung did believe, like you said, in these kind of two layers of the unconscious, the personal unconscious, which is very similar to the way that Freud saw the unconscious. So it would be things that are repressed or things that are forgotten, you know, memories of your fourth birthday party that are in there somewhere mm -hmm. that, you know, you're not going to access ordinarily. Um, it, it could be, uh, you know, um, uh, the shadow, for example, these these things that were kind of disallowed in the course of your growing up that you've learned to kind of tuck away and things that are in the shadow are often things like greed or sexuality or anger, depending on, on your culture and the culture of your family and your community, the things that you were you were not allowed to be. So now they're sort of in the shadow, which is not too far from consciousness usually. And, and so, well, and there's a lot more that goes in the per personal unconscious, but you get the idea. Then Jung, Jung posited that underneath that, there's this other layer of the collective unconscious. And he, he at one point used the metaphor of a rhizome that's underground that sends up these shoots, you know, and that were each kind of a shoot, but were connected underneath to mm. the, the rhizome. And um, uh, are you a, a fan of Dr. Seuss? Uh, maybe, maybe a former fan. I haven't read it in a, lo a long time, but I imagine I would still get something out of it were I to crack open one of those books. So there's a, um, there's interestingly, it was, it was like my favorite Dr. Seuss book when I was a kid. And then I reread it as an adult and I was like, oh God, I know, I know why I loved this. It, it's called Miguel Gets Pool. Oh, cool. And it starts with this young, this young boy fishing in a pool. And this guy says, there's nothing in that pool, but garbage. You're never going to catch anything. Right. So that image of the pool just being filled with things that people have thrown away, that's kind of like the Freudian unconscious. Then the, the boy, the narrator of the story says, well, what if this pool is actually connected by an underground river to the sea? And the whole book is just one imagination after another of these incredible Seussian fishes that you can just imagine. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That might be swimming down that river and that he'll catch in this pool. So that to me is a little bit of an image of the collective unconscious, right? We're all tapped into it and it is, I mean, well, so Jung describes it in several different ways, as he usually does about any of his concepts, and it, it's hard to pin it down, like, what is this exactly? But you mentioned kind of ancestral stuff. I think that it's, um, I, I think that it, it's, I, I think of it often as kind of the realm of the instinct. So something, you know, we come into the world with instincts. And we're not blank slates. We have all kinds of instincts. And these are incredible things because they help keep us alive. They, they tell us what to do to stay alive, to give birth to the next generation. We're all gifted with these instincts. And I think that that is kind of partly what we're talking about with the collective unconscious. Jung uh, was very interested in how it gets imaged. And he says that the way it gets imaged is through archetypal imagery. So for example, you know, uh, you know, as a woman, maybe you come into the world with instincts about how to, um, how to give birth and how to parent. And you don't even know you have those instincts until you have a baby. And then all of a sudden your body does these things that you didn't know it could do. You know, one of my favorite book titles ever was uh, a book about breastfeeding and the title was so that's what they're for <laughs> that's like, oh, good. <laughs> oh that's what they're for okay <laughs> you didn't you know like you didn't know that you could do that before but you can do that um right and uh but but you know so that's the kind of instinctual kind of biological part but but Jung was also very interested in, okay so what does that look like well it gets imaged in these archetypal images of the mother you know, which, have, you know, from the Venus of Willendorf to all the iconography around Mary and, and on and on and on, we could just go, we could just spend the whole time talking about archetypal images of the mother and all that that is. So that's kind of the makeup of the collective unconscious, or at least that kind of gets us started on it.
Awesome. Well, that's what makes dreams so interesting too, because like dreams are unique to my personal experience or your personal experience, but they also are part of what you might talk about is something that's telling us what to do, right? And that's the collective unconscious. And so dreams to me are something that are fascinating. Like the more I think about dreams, the weirder they become. I couldn't agree with you more. I, I think they, the more I think about dreams, the more powerfully mysterious they become because it's yeah. so clear that they tap into an intelligence greater than ego. Yeah. And totally. I, you cannot convince me otherwise. I've, I've heard enough dreams. I've had enough dreams. And if that isn't just pure straight up wisdom, I don't know what is. Mm. And we should find so, a way to respond to that then. Like, you know, I think having this type of conversation and bringing this type of conversation to the world is one step in the right direction. But I think people need to spend more time just actually physically think or, you know, really thinking about these things. Mm -hmm. and, yeah, it's a shame that we have this kind of materialistic view of dreams. Many people do. Of Well, it's just they don't, you know, I just... I had that term because I just watched some TV show and it doesn't mean anything. When everyone says, I said, no, 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 wait a minute. What, what, what was the image? You know, and they share the, it's like, well, what about this? It's like, wow. You know, so the way that we dismiss dreams is really a shame because there's such a, well, if you, if you listen to the podcast, we always spend the last, you know, third of it talking about our listeners dream. And it's always amazing to me the number of people that write in and say, how did you know that? <laughs> yeah it's, we're just sort of speculating really we don't know these people but people say you know this was incredible what you've gleaned from my dream was really incredible and um you know we get just people send us i get we get dreams we get like three or four dreams a day oh really wow yeah and um in fact we just launched this uh online course that teaches people how to work with their dreams um, because oh, cool. one is like how to remember dreams. I think people have a tough time remembering their dreams. I, I know I don't have a good memory of my dreams. And so it's rare to even be able to really remember three or four personal dreams. So it's pretty impressive yeah, what that I, you're getting what, that many. Yeah, I found like I'm, I've made a habit of writing down my dreams every morning. And I think that's helped me. I think it's helped me record it just because I'm doing it immediately after I wake up. But I think just building some muscle memory around actually taking a dream and putting it onto, you know, you know, putting it onto uh, a word document or a piece of paper in the morning has just built some kind of like cognitive flexibility that maybe I didn't have before. And I think one of the things that are so useful or one of the pieces of wisdom that is really worth listening to in dreams is when something keeps recurring. Like I, I can't be able to attach meaning to every bizarre image or symbol in a dream. And, you know, maybe there is meaning to be found there, but if there's too much disconnection between them, it's hard to kind of draw that through line. But recently I, I've been looking over my uh, dream log the last couple of months and like I've been dreaming of being on a train every, like, you know, every third night. So it's like mm -hmm. at least twice a week I have a dream of being on a train and it's usually a pretty bad dream and occasionally I'll have dreams of being in a car or being on a bicycle and, and now I'm starting to kind of build this narrative around transportation or movement or you know getting from one point to the other through the use of some kind of instrument you know one being kind of more passive like a train and and okay. one other you know the others being like having a little more agency attached to them like a car or a bicycle so I'm still trying to figure out what that means but I think just uh, the act of recording it is what allows you to track those themes over time. Yeah. Well, the train is both passive and collective, mm. right? Where the car is personal and the bike is under your own steam. So mm. those are some differences. You're absolutely right that writing your dreams down uh, does help you. I mean, so first of all, I'll say that in Dream School, our online course, we have a whole unit on remembering your dreams and there's a whole bunch of tips there. But, but certainly the number one thing is to write them down every day, everything, even if you just remember one little scant image, just write it down. I think that it builds up a muscle, but I also think that the unconscious knows that you're waiting to write something down and is more, and is more forthcoming. Whoa. So there's this way that it becomes a little bit like a conversation. And so if you write, if you're, the more you pay attention, the more the dreams give. Um, 
and and I do find that the themes really make a difference. And uh, you know, I've I've always kind of gone back and forth between writing on paper. I really like writing on paper. I don't like to wake up and have to um, type into my phone or um, type into a computer. Although I've tried both, um, but 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 I miss. You know, the nice thing about a digital record is that then you can tech search it for like, let me let me just put in train yeah. and see yeah. all the things that come up. So, so I've recently started um, using the Nebo app on the iPad so that mm. I can write, hand write it, you know, and, and the light's kind of low. It's not disruptive. It doesn't kind of jolt me out of uh, waking up, but then it, you know, it converts your handwriting to text. And so I'm going to try that. Oh, cool. Screen. That's a good idea. Well, maybe you could tell us a little bit more about dream school and your process of interpreting dreams and I guess turning them into something actionable. Mm -hmm. Well, um, okay. That, that has, that question has a couple different parts. Well, I'll just, I'll answer the dream school part first. Um, we developed it in response to all the people contacting us at the podcast, wanting to know more about how to work with their dreams. And you know, real enthusiasm. And it's it's a 12 month online program that kind of walks you through how to work with your own dreams. Uh, so there's, you know, different modules that cover different topics and there's kind of an audio piece and there's written uh, exercises and that kind of thing. And you can find out more about it at our website, which is thisunionlife.com. When, when I work with a dream with a patient, it's really different than what we do on the podcast because of course, I have that whole person's life story. I've got the person in front of me, and I want to know um, if they bring in a dream about, um, uh, let's say, um, a basket of oysters that they're about to shuck. I, I want to know, well, how do you feel about oysters? Well, you know, when, do you have any memories of eating oysters? Do you like oysters? You know, um, tell, tell me more about how you like to eat them or whatever. Mm -hmm. um, uh, whereas on the podcast, we don't really have much of that information. So on the podcast, we're, we're really kind of skipping over for the most part, the personal associations, which are extremely, extremely important. And when I'm working with someone face to face, that's always the first thing I do is what are your personal associations? Because for example, I mean, if, if we, if we talk about oysters, I mean, oysters are kind of interesting, at least interesting symbolically because they're this kind of hard carapace around something very soft. So what about that? And oysters create pearls. So that's also really interesting, you know, symbolically. So we could wonder all this kind of stuff, but we don't know the first thing about how the dreamer feels about oysters. And so it's like, well, I love oysters and they're, they're such a treat and I hardly ever have them versus I hate oysters. I think they're absolutely disgusting and I haven't had one in 20 years. You know? Yeah. It's, it's, so it's really different, you know, where it's like my, my boyfriend loves oysters. I mean, you know, it's going to really shape what we do with the interpretation. So on the podcast, we're, we're more looking at the two levels that I think of as kind of explanation. For example, an oyster has a hard shell with a soft interior. And then also kind of archetypal amplification, which would be, you know, to the extent that that imagery has turned up in fairy tales or in mythology or religious systems. I mean, I don't know that oysters have turned up much and fairy tales or myths, but pearls sure have. Mm, pearls true. have a big kind of archetypal component. You know, there's even this idea of the pearl of great price. And that would be a kind of a symbol for the high, something of the highest value. Mm. So, um, you know, there's take all of that in and, and sift it around and then see what seems to rise to the top. So if we're talking about symbolism, you just mentioned the whole oyster um, metaphor there. Can you talk about what type of symbolism might be required in our current climate in humanity in terms of bringing us more together instead of more divided? Mm. And what sort of projections are we as a collective really putting out there when we see cities burn and riots take place? So now, what is the projection that's actually coming from our collective, you know, oneness? And then what kind of symbolism can we use or what kind of symbols can we use to bring people, to, people yeah, together? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, Jung said something like, the best political work any of us can do is withdraw our shadow projections. 
we haven't talked much about this, but I mentioned the shadow before. So these 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 parts of you, Jung said something like the shadow is everything we wish we weren't or something something like that. That's mm. like a bad paraphrase, but it's like it's like those things about us that make us uncomfortable about ourselves that we would rather not know. And what yeah. we tend to do is project those out on other people. So when we see this kind of political polarization that's going on now, a lot of what's going on is projection, projection of our shadows. So, um, you know, it's like that they, they, whoever they are, are all bad. And, you know, my team is all good. Well, it, the world actually doesn't work like that. And so I think that, um, you know, really on a, on a deep level, we do need to do a kind of personal work around this. I would say that m the vast majority of Jungian analysts are very uh, kind of left of center. And, and most of our analysians also, at least mine, are left of center, although not all of them. Um, but, so I'm always interested by how many people have come in over the past four or so years with Donald Trump dreams. Mm. And I would say that a lot of time, a lot of times in the psyche of someone who is um, politically liberal, Donald Trump either appears like very ambivalently or positively. Interestingly, like people have dreams that he's the benevolent father or that they're having sex with him or that, you know, and it's really great or that, um, you know, he turned out to be a really great guy. Wow. Um, yeah, and it's it's or or sometimes he's appe he appears just a little more ambivalently, more more a little bit like a trickster, but he usually does not appear as a bad guy. And these are people who virulently hate Donald Trump, you know, with a passion. Right. But they'll but they'll turn up in their psyche in this other way. So dreams have a way of kind of compensating the conscious attitude, and I think that these Donald Trump dreams are kind of a a little bit of an invitation for us to figure out. Where is my inner Donald Trump? That's the consciousness raising question rather than, you know, and, and I'm, I, I'm not an apologist for Donald Trump. <laughs> <laughs> I, you know, I'm in the camp of, I can't stand the guy, but on a psychological level, if I just spend my days denouncing and decrying Trump and his followers, I'm just, I, I guarantee you somewhere in there, I'm projecting my shadow onto him and or his yeah. followers. And so it's a much, uh, it, it, the, the psychological response is, hmm, where is that in me? What part of me is that? And how can I, uh, instead of demonizing the other people, how can I take back those projections and, and maybe meet these, these people that I, that I don't admire, that I don't agree with, but at, at least with some, at least with some curiosity. We've talked about, uh, you know, this concept of double clicking into people, actually being curious about people, just going beyond, you know, what you see and actually getting to understand their story. And if we go back to the question around what type of symbols we could use, maybe it's a symbol around uh, heartbreak and the fact that we're all human. And, you know, Brene Brown has said that you'll never meet a person who doesn't have a story that didn't break your heart. So maybe yeah, that's, that's the connection great. that we need, you know? That's great. Yeah, that's that's great. And to and to be curious about each other and to to want to know about that story that the other person has that break my heart. I, I really like that. I, I really like that a lot. And I think that, you know, so we're talking about empathy and we're also talking about empathic imagination because we're not always going to be able to get to know every person that we come in contact with well enough to hear that story that's going to break our heart, but we can imagine it. And we right. can know that it exists and we can know that somewhere under that the surface of that odious person there are these other elements you know no one is simple no one is simple and uh we can hold uh space for each other's complexity and not not kind of flatten the other person with our projections yeah and i'm curious you know when i know we're here to talk about psychology not history but can you think of any period in time where a massified collective of people were able to keep their projections in check? Because you know, I think part of what compelled Young was the urgency of the time he was in and the, the projections that led to you know, World War I and World War II. And maybe we're not quite there yet, but I do think that there is 
there are some parallels between the crisis of crisis of his moment and the crisis of our moment today. I'm wondering, you know, looking back at history as a blueprint, has there been ever been a situation where people were able to come together, um, you know, by the thousands or millions and heal their own projections? Or does it just kind of spiral to a spiral down to a point where it ends in catastrophe? I, I don't think it always spiral, spirals down. I mean, Jung did say at one point, talking about the future of humanity, something like, you know, we sort of hang by a thread and what will make the difference. I think he was talking about nuclear war was the ability of people to kind of um, take back their projections and do their own psychological work. But I'm thinking about the um, the mass shooting that occurred in um, in Pennsylvania, in Pennsylvania Dutch country, some number, maybe it was like 10 years ago, Someone opened fire, I think, in a church or something or a school and killed a whole bunch of people, including a bunch of kids. And the, the Amish um, uh, kind of rallied around the family of the shooter with wow. forgiveness, you know? And, and you, you hear these, these stories about um, like, like work that's been done around truth and reconciliation in South Africa or um, at the end of... Um, the, the 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 troubles in Northern Ireland, these um, you know these these uh, efforts to bring about reconciliation and forgiveness always involve this kind of psychological work. Yeah, that's pretty mm-hmm. deep because it requires this filter of being able to say that was that person's choice. And now here comes my choice in response yeah. to that. So it's like, yes. you can't control the fact that he went and, or she went and shot a bunch of people, but you can't control what you do from there. Yes. Yes. Kind of goes back to the inner locus of control. It does. It does. That, you know, that we have a choice at that point. And what, what's the choice that we're going to make? And the Amish coming together and saying, hey, if we forgive, then that family can forgive themselves. And it's this trickle down effect as opposed to saying, oh, I'll never forgive you. And then that family lives the rest of their life and the rest of their generations never being able to let go of that moment. Mm -hmm. And I think inherent in the idea of forgiveness like that is the sense that you can see the humanity in the other person, that you're not just projecting your, um, you know, you, you like, I mean, if someone killed someone that I loved, I would be filled with murderous rage, right? And it would be very easy for me to project that onto you know the the family say of the person who did it you know but but then i'm i'm but then i'm then i'm infected with murderous rage and i'm just putting that out there instead of kind of metabolizing it my anger would get out of control and i would have to bring that back in but yeah <laughs> <laughs> well yeah. and it would be understandable i mean i don't want to sort of say that this would be an easy process but yeah sure no it'd be quite difficult um you know young was very interested in the differences between the archetypal archetypal masculine archetypal feminine i'm curious do you i imagine you see both men and women um some you know i'm sure there are masculine men and feminine men and uh you know vice versa for women but do you see differences in the way that men and women deal with their neuroses or their projections or the way they get in touch with the unconscious i mean i know it's a massive question but i'm curious if there are themes you know that are running through your practice yeah i mean um you know this is this is a big big question and it's somewhat messy and jung used these terms a lot the masculine and the feminine and they're they're kind of problematic terms in a way because what are we actually talking about and you get into the weeds pretty quickly and you're like, oh man, we're, we're talking about like stereotypes, right? You know, but then are we, and is there some basis to these stereotypes and how much of the differences between men and women is biological and how much of it is just kind of, you know, social. I, I mean, I'm, I'm, I, I, these are very open questions to me. I, I don't, um, I think it's probably very nuanced. I, I believe there are some inherent differences kind of like that, I believe it's likely that biology accounts for at least some of the personality differences between men and women, you know, and there are also these, you know, kind of stereotypes that reify those things further and on and on and on. Um, but what I will say just like very, very broadly to your question, and this is not, I mean, this is kind of, um, I think it's very present in the literature is, you know, in general, 
um, women turn to internalize and men turn to externalize. So women are more likely to, to feel depressed and say, I hate myself and I want to die. And that men are more likely to become angry and enraged and want to kind of act out in the world. Obviously, there are a ton of exceptions to that. I know plenty of women whose go-to is rage. And I know some men who feel very kind of oppressed by internal forces that tell them that they're not allowed to be sexual or they're not allowed to be aggressive or whatever. So I don't want to flatten it, but just in general, that tends to be true. Interesting. That's like touching on the concept of aggression and anger a little bit and that whole culture behind that. But moving from there, I would ask, when you're thinking about your client set uh, or the community in general, like what is the emotion that you're finding is the hardest for your clients to actually put in words? Or are all emotions really hard to put into words? What, what are the patterns you're seeing there? Hmm. I love that question because, um, because I think that so much of psychological work is about putting feelings into words. And it's harder than you think, because it's one thing to say, I'm angry, but really the thing that shifts and moves and transforms is being able to take some vague bodily feeling that's just sort of swirling around and be able to find the just right language for it, that I'm, I'm feeling melancholy and a little bit afraid, or it feels kind of like that character in the movie, or it makes me think of this to find an image or, um, or, or, or a metaphor or just right language to say exactly how we're feeling rather than just kind of trading in generalities. Like I'm pissed, you know? Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, uh, so, so it varies. I think it varies um, from person to person, there's there's always some feeling that we've been really disallowed, usually in our family of origin or by the culture. So, you know, for men, again, this is just very broadly, but for men, it's likely to be feelings around kind of vulnerability or, or tenderness or fear. Those are things that men are not really supposed to feel. And for women, a lot of times it is anger. Now, again, I know men who it's really hard for them to admit to talk about anger. So I don't want to overgeneralize, but um, but a lot of women have a, a lot of trouble with anger. A lot of trouble with anger. That's interesting. Or or hate, you know. Yeah, yeah. Just personally, just to share, um, it, it's like I think anger seems to be the hardest thing to really pinpoint for some reason. And again, obviously, you know, this is a super specific viewpoint, just my own. But yeah, just talking out loud with you, it's like I think anger is my hardest emotion to put into words. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it, it can feel destructive, especially depending on how anger was handled in our family of origin. Anger and anger is like anger is like problematic, right? Because it's always messy. Mm -hmm. And now I think there's a thing happening in the culture where younger men, oh, I'm just going to say this, are kind of shamed for being men. And and so there's there's even this extra layer of like oh I better not get angry because then I'm like an example of sort of a toxic guy you know mm, so there there can, there can be these kind of familial issues like if we never saw our parents get angry if our parent if it, or if we got angry and we got in trouble because we were angry and now there's this cultural piece too that you know you um, you better not be an angry man because that's you know. Uh, it, is there, do you think there is a, you know, Jung had the idea of there being shadow poles to specific, I guess, behaviors or emotions or archetypes. And I think sometimes we see certain emotions as exclusively bad and certain emotions or behaviors as exclusively good. Do you think for something like anger, something we typically think of as a bad thing, there is a positive way of expressing that? Well, I would say that, um, yeah, I think in general, we don't like anger in our culture. And, and, you know, for good reason, when it's out of control, it can be genuinely destructive. But there's, you know, it's also incredibly important. You know, all of, all of the emotions just have so much wisdom in them, embodied wisdom, you know. Feelings start in the body. And when we're feeling angry, it's, it's alerting us that, that, you know, someone has trespassed on our territory somehow. 
that there's that we're in danger or that or that someone has crossed a line and so that's an important thing to know i think that um uh anger itself is uh um you know ultimately ultimately what matters is sort of what we do with it and of course there can be really positive ways of expressing it but i think the first job is just to let ourselves feel it to mm. allow ourselves to be angry to know that we're angry you know maybe that means like having a ranty conversation in the car when you're driving by yourself at whoever it is that bothered you or writing about it in your journal or talking it over with a friend or um you know uh going for a run and listening to really angry music or whatever it is but just allow allow it to be there you know yeah it's really interesting when you see people that you know are typically very amicable and um mild and sort of even diffident explode into like a fit of anger like i have one friend who is you know mr nice guy with everyone and someone cut him off in the street and you know it was like just the beast came out of him fuck you you know just a, it was totally um counter to how he carries himself in almost every situation that i've seen him in and i feel like a lot of times we do um take those emotions and bury them in our unconscious and when they do express themselves it is unhealthy so we trick ourselves into thinking well it must be a bad emotion but if you are able to integrate it in and express it in small healthy ways and feel it as you said in your body instead of hiding it away there is kind of a right way to do those things instead of exploding into a fit of anger or a fit of sadness or a fit of you know vulnerability yeah well when we banish something it, it kind of Go, goes out into the forest and kind of picks up energy actually and it and it becomes kind of wilder and less domesticated so um I, I think that's a great example and my guess is that your your friend when he does get angry it isn't um it isn't very constructive you know it's it's not it, it he maybe he looks foolish or feels foolish afterwards or kind of you know scares people but doesn't inspire respect that kind of thing i mean i think mm. i think that carrying authority you have to be able to access your anger and aggression if you hope to if you hope to carry authority because sometimes people do stupid shit that you need to call out you know mm -hmm. and and you you need access to that sort of fire in order to do that but i think it has to be kind of integrated so you're right if you just say oh my gosh this is dangerous and i just can't i can't have this you know you're you're going to get into trouble but if you can allow yourself to feel angry and then and then maybe have a discernment process about what you want to do with that like maybe if your friend pissed you off you want to you know have those ranty conversations by yourself in the car or you know write the letter that you're not going to send or whatever and then you could say okay now now what do i want to do about this and it's like no i really need to set a limit around this it's not fair that i don't know he keeps on arriving half an hour late every time we say we're going to meet somewhere you know which is not something that happens to people anymore in the days of covid but <laughs> before yeah. you know? yeah. so so then you know you sit down and you say listen you know you did this thing you've done it before it's not okay with me and the the anger at that point can inform your your body how you hold yourself your tone of voice and if it's integrated if it's not integrated it can come across as as shrill or edgy um if it's integrated it just comes across as firm mm. yeah i don't know a lot of people like that maybe that's just a symptom of our time that kind of have that um that that sort of self-possession you know what i mean where they're calm in an authoritative way i think we I, th I think you've mentioned in one of your most recent podcasts we do live in a very nice culture um mm -hmm. which i think does force people to repress a lot of those more confrontational emotions, I guess. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It created like a bottled true. up environment for everyone. Everyone's bottled up with their emotions and thoughts because you can't say anything without the possibility that it might offend someone. And, and that, you know, when you can't let that out of your system, you repre repress it, you suppress it. And you mentioned it earlier, the more you do that, the more you're actually thinking about it, you give it more yeah. life. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, and it just takes up more and more and more, and then, and then the right environment happens and things explode. Either personally, you know, like when you're in a relationship and you just keep on not saying and not saying anything and not saying anything, and then one day it's just like ah, or collectively, <laughs> you know. Totally. Yeah. 
Well, one thing I wanted to I wanted to ask you, Lisa. I guess this is kind of a higher level question, but you know, going back to the beginning of the conversation, we talked about how Carl Jung really did embrace the irrational and was interested in not only knowledge but interested in wisdom and not only interested in reason but interested in intuition as well. You know, is do you see people as they begin to search for meaning, as they feel a lack of meaning in their life, having more of an appetite for that that pull of life that I think has been slowly deteriorating since like the enlightenment? If not before. Mm. I do. I, I do see that people, I mean, when they, you know, life can feel sort of uh, uh, monotone, you know, it can kind of feel just like it's in black and white until you start tapping into the irrational. And then it's like suddenly in technicolor. And it's like everything really comes alive. And that can, that can be a very, very special thing. And it's cool to see that process happen for someone where all of a sudden they, they're just so excited about their dreams and they're, you know, they start reading things and they're, you know, interested in this and interested in that. And um, it doesn't always happen, but it, it does happen sometimes. And I think a lot of people that seek out a Jungian analysis are maybe already in that space. But, you know, it's... Um, so there's there's a, a book that I think kind of taps into a lot of what we talk about, which I mention all the time on the podcast, because I just think this, this book is just like, it's just incredible. It's called The Master and His Emissary. Cool. And it's by a British kind of psychiatrist and polymath, Ian McGilchrist, who has just spent, I don't know how long, writing this book and researching the bicameral brain and the different ways that the different hemispheres kind of operate and what they, um, how they relate to the world. And, and, you know, his basic thesis is that the right brain is the master and the left brain is the emissary. And it, the title is taken from a little parable that I think was written by Nietzsche, uh, where the, 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 the emissary usurps the master. And so it should be that we're guided by our right brain, which is more about contextual and the implicit and a sense of embodiment and connection and kind of, you know, forest instead of the trees and uh, this sort of holistic way of looking at the world versus the left brain, which is kind of atomized and decontextualized and explicit and um, uh, kind of, you know, linear and sequential and you know, McGilchrist is very clear that both are needed, but that um, the, that we've become as a culture just way, way kind of hypertrophied in the left brain. And as to your point about the enlightenment, he traces, he traces kind of his history looking at this, saying that, you know, this movement toward the left brain, the left hemisphere kind of started in ancient Greece. And he traces it through the art and through the philosophy. And there were these times when the pendulum swung back a little bit. Like, for example, in the Renaissance, mm, we were yeah. a little bit more right-brained. And the Enlightenment, yeah, a, a more left-brained. And then we've got this, you know, car, kind of Cartesian, well, there's the, the mind and the body, you know. And then the, 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 romantic, the romantic period sort of brought a little bit of resurgence of kind of right brain approach. I think that this maps on to what Jung was talking about, essentially. And I actually think, and I, I'm hoping at some point to take some time and, and really ex explore this and expand it and see if I can actually nail it down. But I think we were talking about before about the masculine and the feminine and what Jung was actually talking about. I think Jung actually was talking about these different ways of looking at the world with the right brain, brain being more feminine, kind of you know, receptive, contextualized, related, and the left brain being uh, more masculine or, or kind of like Apollonian, you know, it's like reason, you know, rationality, linearity, decontextualized. Interesting. So, um, really good. So, so yeah, Interesting. so, and, and I mean, and, you know, if you read McGilchrist, it's just, you know, it's kind of a stunning thesis because he just talks about how far we've gone down this road of kind of this hypertrophy left hemisphere world. And, and what that kind of means, what it means for our relationship with ourselves, with our bodies, with the planet. I mean, it's, it's, it's a stunning book. 
That's a great recommendation. Just wanted to pull off of something you said a few minutes ago around going from monotone to irrational, and that adds elements to your life and it mm-hmm. can spice things up in a way. How are you? How would? What type of advice would you give to someone who, or how would you support a procrastinator? <laughs> God. Uh, um. Well, it's an, it's interesting that you framed it like that. And I'm wondering if you are thinking, if you have a particular thought about the relationship become, between like kind of procrastination and this idea of life being sort of too monotone. I do, because I think that unless you're going to make that jump from being in a monotone, some people choose to be monotone. Some people don't necessarily want to go into the irrational. And I think that is a person who may be masking something themselves, a fear, an insecurity, some sort of anxiety. And so those people exist in your circle. And, you know, you have, if you're going to be the person that you want to be, that means supporting people. So like, I want to support people no matter where they are in their journey, just like I want to be supported no matter where I am in my journey. And so there are going to be people in my circle that are procrastinators or people that I meet that are procrastinators and I have to support them. So how should I support a a procrastinator who Mm -hmm. is maybe masking something and Mm -hmm. maybe, uh, maybe I'm answering my own question as I'm talking (laughs) about it in terms of like helping them reveal that about themselves and, help them get over that anxiety and help them think about getting rid of some fears and being more free in terms of understanding that they can feel their feelings. So I guess I just answered that question. Yeah. Yeah. I can, I can sort of add to it. I think that's a great, a great way of looking at it. I think procrastination is a lot about avoidance. I think that's Mm -hmm. really what it is. I don't think it's time management issue. I think it's about avoidance. And I think it's about, in particular, avoiding overwhelming feelings. I mean, I'm thinking about sort of academic procrastination because it's something that I've had some experience with. Um, luckily, not personal experience with, but, but just in helping people through it. Um, is What happens is you've got an assignment. It feels overwhelming. And so what you do with an overwhelming feeling is you decide to avoid it. And that is a short-term way of managing a problem. It's a maladaptive way, but in the moment it works because if you've got a huge paper to write and you're feeling overwhelmed and you say, well, I could sign on, look at the syllabus and start working on the paper, or I could watch Netflix. The minute you decide to say, you know what, I'm just going to watch an episode of my new show, you immediately feel better. You immediately, your body feels better. You've just avoided an unpleasant experience. And so you get a, a positive feedback loop there. It's like, oh, good. That worked. I feel better. The problem is that when your show is over, you 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 keep on having to do the the behavior again and again because it doesn't it doesn't it doesn't actually solve the problem. Of course, it just makes right. it worse. And dig a deeper and, hole, right? And dig a deeper hole, and then what happens is you feel ashamed. Hmm. And then you, in addition to the overwhelm of like, oh God, what is it going to take to write this paper? Then you feel like I'm a piece of shit. You know, mm-hmm. and so then you've got two big negative emotions to avoid. So then you watch another show, and after that, you you still get you've got less time to work on the paper, and you feel worse about yourself. So actually, unwrapping procrastination takes a tremendous amount of self compassion, because the very that. first thing you have to do is forgive yourself. You have to say. I'm having a really hard time with this. I'm really struggling. I deserve compassion, um, you know, and get out of this rut of like, I'm, I'm such a piece of shit, not, you know, whatever, the kinds of things people say to themselves. And often kind of things that, you know, to be true, to be truthful, that parents will say to their kid who's, you know, procrastinating, procrastinating, what's wrong with you? Don't you understand? You're going to fail out of college or whatever. <laughs> it's like, that doesn't actually, doesn't actually help. I, I can tell you from personal experience, it's absolutely impossible to avoid saying that if you're yeah. a parent of a procrastinator, but it doesn't help. What helps is saying, this is really hard. You know, this is overwhelming. You know, you deserve, you know, compassion. You deserve a hug. Um, you deserve, you know, some comfort. And then let's sit down together and, and take 15 minutes and just look at the assignment. That's all we have to do right now. And then after, after you've looked at the assignment, let's go have a cup of tea. Then we'll go back and we'll come up with a plan for how we do the assignment or something like that. 
So you have to help people find self-compassion. That's so awesome. Yeah, that uh, is definitely a novel approach to procrastination. I don't think I've ever encountered uh, tackling it with compassion. So I think that's super powerful. I I know we're almost at uh, time here, Lisa. One thing I did want to ask you as a kind of final fun question, Jung was obviously really interested in myths and stories and archetypal stories. I'm curious, do you have a favorite story, be it a movie or a TV show or a book? Uh, that you've consumed in recent memory, and maybe you can tell us why it was so impactful for you. Um, gosh, that's a hard one. I mean, I love fairy tales, and I, um, you know, work a lot with fairy tales. And in, in fact, I have a book coming out in the spring that looks at motherhood as a self development process, and I use fairy tales throughout the book. And I would have to say that my favorite fairy tale is probably. Vasilisa the Beautiful, which is a Russian fairy tale. Hmm. And um, I love it because it is very, very deep. It has super, super deep themes. It recapitulates an ancient, ancient myth of female initiation. But there's also all this wonderful kind of color in it. Baba Yaga is just a great, great character. She's this fearsome witch in Russian fairy tales. And she... um, She's terribly frightening. She eats people. She rides around through the forest in a mortar, pushing herself along with a pestle. Her house stands on chicken legs and can walk around. Oh, creepy. And it's fenced in, it's very creepy. It's fenced in by a fence that's made of human bones and human skulls. And at night when it gets dark, the skull's eyes light up. So there's some wonderful illustrations of this stuff too. She's just such a, but she's actually a, a kind of primordial nature goddess. Uh, and she's got all this, the kind of lore around her is just wonderful. And, 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 and I, I uh, loved that fairy tale when I was a kid. Baba Yaga is just um, such a great character. And then to kind of grow up and, and learn more about all this stuff and realize that she's an image of kind of ancient feminine earth wisdom is, mm-hmm. is just even better. So, I mean, there's lots about that fairy tale, but that's probably my favorite fairy tale. Cool. We'll put it in the show notes for sure. That's awesome. Okay, great. Maybe you can tell our audience where to find you either online or um, podcast stream school. Feel free to make a plug if you'd like to. Sure. So uh, um, the podcast and dream school can be found at thisjungianlife.com. And um, in terms of my book, which will be coming out in May of 2021, if there are any moms or moms-to-be listening who want to hear a Jungian take on motherhood, um, my author website will soon be lisamarciano.com. I'm in the process of building the author website. I feel like there was so much insight here. So I just want to say thank you for your time. I really enjoyed it. You guys were great. Awesome. Thank you so much, Lisa. It was a really great conversation. All right. Thank you so much. Thank you for tuning into this episode of Rising Laterally. We hope you enjoyed the conversation and were able to walk away with some new thinking that could help you in your personal or professional growth. Please make sure you're subscribed to the podcast. And if you know of someone who could benefit from this episode, we'd love for you to pass it along. See you next week.